is uh, uh, like the introduction set, a project that kind of has uh, two different uh, hats or maybe even three different hats that uh, sometimes you'll hear it in the presentation or what we're doing that I'm, we may put on my on once in a while. And, and one of them would be as an economic development director. Uh, when I returned home from college, I'm actually a consulting meteorologist. I uh, returned back to the community to start that business working with local ag producers. And I had uh, parents that were uh, ill at the time and uh, six siblings in the family to help the family transition the family farm. Um, it is uh, a, a 1,200, it's, it's two, two sections, and then we have another half section located not next to the original two homesteads. Uh, but it is not uh, what we're seeing in today's farm size and scale, uh, which you would you know needed to be a, a successful commodity operation. So uh, in this fifth generation transfer to my generation, uh, it was part of my family's will that this uh, operation could become viable for w at least multiple of the six of us. Uh, five of us live in the community, all work in professional jobs outside of the family farm and uh, looking for a way to uh, move in that direction. Obviously, with my background in meteorology and climatology, uh, sustainable farming was something uh, that is in my career realm. Uh, part of the reason I moved back from Kansas City to the home community uh, was to be, one, open spaces, be closer to the farm, watch my nieces and nephews grow up, but also to apply uh, my, my college degree. Uh, microclimate is very much part of what isn't part of sustainable farming. Uh, permaculture, xeriscaping, things like that can all be applied uh, to, to these sustainable techniques. But out in Northwest Kansas in co commodity ag world, uh, this, this is, uh, you know, we're talking 10, 15 years ago uh, when I'm, we made this decision and started this work, uh, it, it was um, the odd duck, the odd ball, the, the crazy idea at the time. Well, times are changing and uh, I'm, I'm proud to, to be here at this presentation and uh, give a little background. Uh, so you got the economic development director hat there, the, the, the folk, local farm hat, and then my role as the vice president uh, of consumers for the co-op um, is uh, uh, a co-op of originally Northwest Kansas farmers that now has expanded to 50 farms in three states. That's that tri-state area in the corner. Uh, like we said, this was a out of the box idea 10, 15 years ago. Uh, so these farms had to go to the Denver market uh, for our market. It was not local. We didn't have lots of farmers markets or the economy out there uh, is not conducive for uh, direct selling sales of meat. Um, so that little background about the co-op to start this off kind of set the stage for uh, the farms as they grow into the co-op and become part of the process. Um, it's a producer. Um, so actually this came into the economic development office when I served as the economic development director the first three or four years I moved home as a part-time job to supplement the weather. Um, it was uh, Rocky Mountain Farmers Union, Ogallala Commons uh, organization that was working on some youth uh, return home initiatives uh, with the hometown competitiveness model in uh, Northwest Kansas. Uh, this concept formed based off of the Oklahoma Food Co-op which was uh, getting some notoriety and success in the late 90s and early 2000s. So it is a, like Oklahoma, producer and consumer member co-op. You pay $100 to join the co-op and you can do volunteerism or be part of the co-op as a buying member. Uh, in particular, we started in the Denver area with about 30 customers. And then uh, producers are also a member and uh, same thing, $100 to become a producer member. Um, it is bylawed in to be board controlled by the producers. So that is how it we maintains a producer controlled co-op. So by the board structure, it is driven uh, by, by the consumer or by the producer. Um, no, so my role as vice president of consumers is to develop new markets and strategic planning um, as the co-op grows. 
began as the online farmer's market modeled after Oklahoma. Uh, direct sales to customers, it's an online ordering system. Um, they order from whichever farm they want, whichever item, and then we distribute it, drop it off, and trucks and trailers return back to the, to the home originating site, which is in Northwest Kansas. Uh, we're now are transitioning to a regional food hub and aggregator. So we're the first mile aggregator to the producer. Our drop-off points and delivery sites in Denver are the last mile to the consumer. We are picking up some uh, first mile back that comes back to Northwest Kansas. I can talk about that a little bit later. That is developing some backhaul and part of the Northwest Kansas food work that is doing programs uh, on the, more more to start on the food justice side uh, markets, but eventually maybe helping grocery stores and other farmers market with some of their supply issues in the communities as they get up and going. Um, we got uh, one thousand right now. We got one thousand products. We go two times per month to the direct sales uh, during the season. Uh, during the winter months, it's one time a month. Uh, actually, on that direct sales size side. Uh, November is the number one month. Uh, we just did uh, our uh, over 100 orders yesterday and because of Thanksgiving and our turkeys. Uh, our mission and values, uh, we're a producer and consumers un uniting in the interests of locally grown food. Uh, to, uh, we want to be environmentally sustainable, economically viable, and socially just, and cultivate the farmer-consumer relationships. This last thing is the number one core value in the original board of directors, which were all pretty much Northwest Kansas producers or in that tri-state area. Uh, we did have uh, some consumer members from Denver, but they were in part of organizations that had that same mission. It is to revitalize our rural communities. Um, if our rural communities and this sustainable farming that does, is not part of that development piece, um, it, it is critical to the survival of the community. So that is naturally ingrained in our environment where our production and producers are and uh, still the number one or driving mission of the co-op. Uh, this map kind of shows you the infrastructure of, of the co-op. Our customer base obviously is in Denver. Our sorting location hub is right here in the middle. And then our aggregation hub, where the product kind of comes up, we have a truck that comes here, and we got a truck that comes up from the Nebraska producers up here, comes down, and we meet and aggregate here. The orders get sorted and then dropped off in 21 pickup hubs back to these clusters of people. Um, on this map, it's showing the, the dis aggregation, distribution, and processing infrastructure. Every one of these blue sites are one of those pickup hubs. The yellow sites are our collection aggregation uh, centers where, say, 12 farms in this area come in, collect here, and then it collects and collects and goes down the interstate. And same way here, it collects and collects and then eventually gets there. Uh, that's what we call aggregation. These blue are actually the distribution, so when the trailer's here, we leave at uh, seven in the morning, get here about noon, distribute, it goes out, trailers get back here, uh, 7 p.m. on uh, Thursdays, and then these blue route is run on a Friday, and then our weekly route runs out of Bennett on Fridays to the restaurants and stores downtown in Denver. Uh, these, these things are critical here. These are your USDA processing facilities. So that's what makes the clusters of where the farms are. Uh, Kansas initially had mo more processing, so it made more sense why we had farms already doing this a little bit and the capacity to start out here, and this was such a void. Um, Colorado, Kansas has the, the state and USDA inspection. Since we are moving across state lines, we have to have the USDA, so these are all USDA. Uh, there's a combination of mobile processing and fixed facilities in here. And then you get to Colorado and you kind of see what's happening here. Um, they've lost a lot. It's, it's bigger. People have, have tried. They don't have a state inspection system. Uh, so it's created a lot of void around that uh, 
processing. Uh, so basically, uh, like I said, we got a core group here. We're developing that this is an up and coming group. There's some lot of specialty crop production going on there. And then this Colorado South, it's basically from Bennett, Colorado to Colorado Springs, another group of farmers that are, uh, late, you know, they're, they're smaller type farms, but again, they're still main <coughs> markets are coming in there. We do have a co-op down here, a partner co-op on the Arc Valley, uh, one in the Salida area of Colorado and one in the Southwest that comes in here, collects into the system, eventually collect, c connects in Bennett and can backhaul and move up and down this area. Uh, we got a market set in here of six uh, million people. Um, the food hub def definition here, this is what the USDA defines as a food hub. That is where the co-op is moving more in direction. We're very unique because when you think of a food hub, you usually think of the uh, urban definition, which you've you know, Philadelphia, East Coast, Sacramento, Portland. Out here in this High Plains region, our, our, our population center is Denver, but high price of land and this distribution and lack of processing, it's a whole different landscape out there when we talk of hubs. So USA definition is manages aggregation, distribution, and marketing of source identified local and regional uh, product and the, these are the markets that uh, typically a food hub uh, works in. Again, we had to start retail because we we're very, very small farms. Um, they had to become sustainable, learn, grow, learn the rules and regulations. Um, as we go, we're just starting to enter into some of this volume retail thing. And then eventually, the big demand is going to come from these food hubs is how do we service the institutional markets. The interest in the market is there. This, this more distribution and processing and system isn't in place. The local food system has lots of gaps in it in this part of the country. Uh, the key thing to take from this here is this five to 10 anchor producers. Uh, uh, USDA statistics say that it takes 600K to 1 million to sustainably run the food hub function of a uh, what we're doing with the food co-op. And history shows that it takes seven to 11 years to get there. Um, times are changing. Uh, the window of opportunity, the market demand, things are pressurizing there. They think that's now three to seven. And that in our particular case, since the distance we're working with in the area, we're probably more closer to the million plus before um, it works for the food co-op. Um, the aggregation part, you hear that term, what is it? This will give you a little bit of an idea. Um, it, it's the, the meat of the co-op the, the co or what we do. Um, we do the, like my position was to connection relationships and creating the market opportunity. Then we source the product from the farms, links that production with the needs that we've identified in the market and do the logistics to get it there. That's the drop sites, the label, the tracking, the pickup, delivery, the sorting, the distribution. And the more important thing is we keep that value chain from the producer to the end consumer. It is the know your farmer. It's the, I wanna know where it comes from. I wanna know if my producer is organic. And the website allows that to be listed individually by the farm. Uh, the farm controls their prices. We have a percentage it is on the consumer side of 10% and the producer side of 15. And we, we try to, to average around that 20% um, margin, uh, similar to other food industry type businesses. So it is a low margin, intense infrastructure uh, type business, but we keep that value chain to stay in the uh, local food or uh, sustainable business model. Uh, this is the history of the co-op, the sales. Only thing I want to limit here, this was the direct sales uh, side of the co-op is producers learn and grow. We saw a little bit of a jump here that year. I, uh, we basically, some of this change in, in here to here was due to some website and internal inf changes. And then here you're noticing that volume 
side uh, taking effect. It's uh, uh, changing the dynamics of the co-op. We're nearing this, we are in tween age stage now where we're still volunteer board. Uh, we got a few part-time positions, but now we got to start making serious changes as far as, you know, what we're going to do as a co-op uh, to be sustainable. Um, this, this, you know, so obviously being a producer in the co-op and uh, uh, the presentation topic here is poultry. Um, we, we, we had, you know, some meat. Our limiting factor on the, the meat is the processing. So we have been, had to form an entity uh, to, to, process, to raise chickens, process them, and then enter them into this market demand. Um, you've heard the other farms in this conference talk about poultry. That, that's the uh, uh, money, the interest, uh, opportunity. Uh, you heard the processing issue coming up uh, to solve that. But when we did um, our expansion plan studies, it said the capacity, you know, the, the ability for all these farms to do some poultry production, enter into this system, and go to Denver is probably the leader or the first entity or first product to become an anchor product in the system. Follow that with specialty crops because that's sexy and that's the highest demand thing. If you can grow the specialty crop producers, work on that at the same time and then work on this processing and start building up meats and grains and some of the other uh, items that can go into the system to build the food hub. Um, so here's our history with High Plains Poultry. Uh, our, our, uh, our first poultry farmers were several of them. I think there might have been, uh, of the 12, at least uh, five to half of them had poultry on the farm, selling at the local farmer's markets, eggs, or trying to go into schools and that. So, so we, we had these small orders going to Denver in 2008 and 10. Uh, um, uh, that kept that system kept on going, and then in 2011, we're like, "Hey, here's some opportunity." So the poultry farmers started growing. Um, at that time, we had to go to McPherson, Kansas, so you can imagine what was going on. We had Colorado farmers picking up chickens all the way back to McPherson. You drop them off, have to go back home, and then send another vehicle to go pick them up and come back, and very cost inefficient. Um, and then one of the producers in, in uh, uh, Atwood, at Rollins County area, decided, well, we're gonna go ahead and invest. Uh, we want to grow as a beef producer, expanding the poultry side of the meat business, because we're going to uh, do uh, poultry, bought the processing equipment to basically do it on the farm, but we had to do it USDA, so they, because uh, of a ostrich license at the local processing plant allowed them to have the ability to do poultry in the facility. So basically the farmer rented the kill room and the day on one day a month or whenever he, when they weren't killing, uh, they used that room to process the poultry in scale and start uh, uh, moving more poultry through the system. Uh, 2012, uh, we did that expansion plan that said, you got the infrastructure there, go for it with the eggs and the meat. Uh, uh, that's where you guys need to, or where the co-op should start, focusing its uh, attention. And then the group of farmers in 214 said, we got to figure out a way to do our processing because we're in the local guy's way and we're tired of going to McPherson. So we did the SARE grant. Uh, the rest of this presentation will go into the process of what we did during the grant. Uh, 2015, we ended up deciding to construct an MPU, which is part of the SARE grant process. And then as you saw in the growth of the co-op, most of that growth, or about 28% of it, uh, is the meat and the eggs. Uh, the rest is, we're now we're able to go weekly. We do have some beef going into that system and some of the specialty crops. So there is a small percentage of that growth that uh, is opening the ways for those other farms now to, to grow their markets as well. Um, so our SARE project, this was our uh, performance targets and objectives. 
Uh, we wanted to organize first, estimate the startup and operating costs of a, uh, at that time we were, couldn't, we were still thinking fixed, uh, will this thing be mobile? We still uh, built it as a mobile, but uh, it's really fixed uh, at this point. Uh, determine the feasibility, uh, find a site, do the permitting that's required both locally, state, and USDA, federal, equipment purchasing and fabrication, implementation, startup, and develop a plan to enter that co-op uh, market opportunity. Um, this is the outcomes and the impacts. Uh, as you can see, we got the plant up and running in October of 2015. And uh, the co-op, that was the first year we were able to really deliver through the winter. With a, with, a, with a product item. So we did 600 chickens and 23 turkeys at Thanksgiving. Uh, this year, this year we are, I, you know, I think this, is, this was a close estimate to where we're at at the end of the year. And we just did our turkeys. Um, so I can't, it's an estimated total. And this in our projection and feasibility is where we thought the processing plant would end up in 2019 fully use, utilizing uh, the crews and what can be done in the, the unit that we built. Um, our revenues, this was from these right here. Uh, this is what you saw in that graph for 2016, that 25% of that 400,000. And this is what this would do in 2019. Uh, uh, and then as far as the farms go, uh, right here, it was two farms. Right here, uh, three or four. And then here, we could be up to 12 uh, uh, working in this uh, facility. Our, our other outcomes and impacts, we wanted uh, to increase jobs, obviously, because the economic development. 2016, it was family part-time labor. Uh, this year, we have paid four to eight part-time workers operating two, three, two days processing, one day packaging. And then we have this projection for 2019. Um, again, I, I brought this back up to uh, really highlight that $100,000 increase in the co-op sales is sitting here for an anchor producer. If we can get four or three more of those, say a hydroponic vegetable facility, uh, something else creating that same volume, we're on our way to, to being a sustainable and viable food hub. Okay, um, back to the MPU. Um, here we, f we started up our accomplishments. We formed an entity uh, for four farms to be able to invest into the, uh, we didn't take, uh, other than the uh, uh, funding that we had in the SARE grant, we actually formed an LLC to invest with four farms. Uh, we did the startup business plan, fabrication and budget, uh, did the financing uh, within our original SARE grant. I think we had 15,000 of it going to the infrastructure and equipment and fabrication costs. And, uh, um, and then the rest was um, equity investment from each of the farms. Uh, the feasibility, um, obviously our current situations weren't feasible. Uh, this is, was where we're still kind of at, and this has to do, uh, uh, we, we, we decided to go mobile by looking at, we toured, um, uh, went to Bauman's, uh, uh, Anita's, and, and watched what their fixed facility did. We went to Calicrates uh, in St. Francis's beef processing plant, then we went to Taos, New Mexico, and saw where they had a, a, a mobile unit that was fixed and uh, doing all si kinds of livestock in it, lamb, pigs. Uh, one day they had some, you know, they, they were doing everything in Tahoe's. Um, uh, site location, travel, available labor, took all that into consideration. Uh, when we did our economics on it, we're, from the McPherson stuff, we were saving $3 per bird. Um, thought uh, with those numbers of, oh, it showed up there, we figured this unit will break even operational costs sometime next year around the 12,000 to 15,000 uh, chicken per year mark. And uh, we started, at, I think we're at 450 for processing of a bird. 
Um, if you're cutting it, it's another, cutting them up into parts, another $1.25, uh, give you kind of an idea what the costs are. Uh, this is probably the biggest variable. We thought we were gonna do this in three or four months and be up and running last June. We didn't start till October last year, so it uh, um, took us 14 months to do that. Um, and this was probably the biggest reason for that. We did have some, uh, since we farmers built it ourselves, uh, particularly with the lead of one of the farmers who was looking at doing this anyway uh, on their own. Um, um, so we, with, there was some time to fit into our personal farming schedules. It created some time, but the biggest was the hoops to get USDA, state, all these food safety regulatory issues in line and understanding them and knowing what we were doing. I don't want anybody to get the, the notion that the USDA is against or all the things you hear that why you can't do this. They want to work with you. It's just new to them and they aren't staffed and you're, you're dealing with regions and moving employees for like our F, F, FSIS had to come from Arkansas. Um, our everyday inspector that has to be on site had to be trained because he's never seen poultry in his life being in Kansas. So we had, you know, so all that took time to put it together and then everybody's receptive at USDA. We want to learn how to do this because this is an opportunity for, for everyone. Mm -hmm. uh, what are those FSIS? Uh, that is food safety inspection, something. This is hazard critical access point, plant, you know, the, within the plant, every food safe point, critical point where a bacteria could develop on the chicken, you have to have a check and a process in place, uh, standard safe operating procedures. So that's your plan to all the way through from the cage into the plucker and, and you, all your processes are keep the mice out of the facility, clean bathrooms, you name it, uh, it's in there. Um, and, uh, you know, there, we, we had to take our, one of our farmers, you know, took the training and did a lot of this work, you know, internally. Uh, so we owe a lot to, to that process there. Uh, our scale up plan, um, this is basically what, what, we're, what that and them numbers showed you. Uh, 500 um, as we speak, we can capacity to go to that. Uh, 100, a shift does, uh, because of this, a shift of five to seven, it's like we got seven people on a shift, can do, if they're really good, they're getting up here around this number. Uh, in three hours, that's about how many birds we process. And since we air chill them, um, these are going into the air chiller and you have to have them down to 40 degrees in three hours and then afternoon the inspector has his eight hour day and so that, that's about all you can do in a shift. Now you could run two shifts, have two inspectors, you could go to more days a week and bring in another inspector but that's down the road. Uh, we, uh, that'll take time, might be a new, might have to be a second inspector um, so those are some things that, le uh, that either slow the growth or um, put you in this plan. And again, that break even in 2017. Okay, here, here is our design. Uh, we ended up, we, we purchased a reefer trailer. And then um, if you saw the picture here, we actually, this processing, there's a, our local vet office is here, and this is just north of Atwood, about two miles. Uh, this is his circular drive. He's got pins back there. We, we operate, we rent this from the local vet, and then when we're processing our cars, park here, and we load the chickens in the back, from the back end. Um, so they come in this back end. Right here is the inspector's area. He's got a restroom, a locker, a desk, uh, uh, clothing there. The chickens load on that back side. They come in. Uh, we use killing cones. Here's our plucker. We have uh, one person here, two people working in here, 
and then we hand through here to the eviscerating area. Uh, we have, uh, you know, the inspector stands over here, and the chickens. We got, you know, the legs and cutting the lunning, and then checking the feathers. So you got a lot of checking here, and to get that bird into the air chiller. So that's how it runs through there. Um, again, we're doing about 150 in three hours. Um, the air chill here, generally they, they'll break for lunch, uh, come back, and then they can either start packaging or generally we let them sit overnight and, and start doing it the next day. These, this market that all of these chickens are going to is fresh meat going back to Denver restaurants right now. Uh, we, and they want three, I think it's two and a half to three and a half pounders because then they split them in half and make about two meals out of them. Um, anything that's low, smaller or bigger, we freeze it and that goes into our local sales, uh, right markets. Um, benefits, uh, convenient and efficient. Uh, cost effective, easier to access in a USDA inspected facility. Um, um, the challenges, probably asking how much it costs to do this. Uh, I talked about the construction time. Uh, when you're doing it ourselves, the regulatory processes, and then the funding. Uh, we, we thought when we did our original budget, it would be around $50,000. It ended up being 75, and a lot of that we, we did calculate a value on time and um, where we are, so that kind of gives you an idea. If you were to go buy this already prepared and not go through the, uh, that trailer on Cornerstone, I think I saw of that size was about $130,000 for all the equipment. So it, it does save some. Mm -hmm. um, uh, regulatory, you know, and, and for us, the other reason we 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 kind of do believe that at some point it may grow to where we possibly need a fixed facility, particularly um, where maybe different, but we're covering a lot of area, so maybe it's doing multi-species and that. Those were so unanswerable at the time that we just wanted to focus on the chicken, and then we go, this thing could move to another group of producers once it got full and then we, then we could work on that. So more of the general plan is it will probably move across the state line to one of the other clusters of producers, whether it's up in the Nebraska Panhandle or down there close to Colorado, go through the same process with the permitting and regulatory. And let's say that would take, because we don't want to shut down now. So once that process kicks in, have the other thing up and running so that one can move and, and do that type of transition. Uh, so that that's, that's was a lot of them. When we say mobile, it's not going from farm to farm. Mobile to us was to cross those state lines and do this whole process over again and, and, and go from there. Our, our farms are more mobile. I think to do the, the farm to farm would be wiser for us to get a, do a hub facility that does aggregation and collection and then buy a sprinter vehicle to go to the farms or a tra trailer if they're live and sprinter for vegetables and go pick stuff up and that. But, but that's part of your, you know, if you're doing a food hub, things to consider. Um, so, I mean, those are, you know, you had some of the questions on, on those. Um, again, then, you know, our publications and outreach, we, uh, have a healthy communities initiative in Northwest Kansas. So they chose to do food as their initiative and they sent all their technical assistant people from Eastern Kansas and lawyers from Minneapolis and all that out to watch and tour this when we were processing one day. Uh, so it's being assimilated through those type you know, healthy communities, communities if you're from, there's 20 of them in Kansas. They uh, have a pretty good idea of what's going on out there and would connect with us. Uh, the USDA employees themselves um, are talking and, and you know, they, they I, like I said, are probably receptive of seeing more poultry in Kansas uh, and working working uh, with farmers to, to do more of it. 
uh, our High Plains Food Co-op annual meeting, this meeting, and uh, other, other meetings are part of our outreach. Um, future recommendations uh, from us, the, the crew or the co-op that worked on this project. Um, work with your policy councils and your states and USDA. If you, if you got the pull to go to Washington and start with the secretary down or somehow, let, let's talk about streamlining this and planning a little bit ahead so, so the next people don't have to take so long. Uh, or another state and coordination somehow there. Um, be honest with the startup funding requirements. Uh, again, it, it's not a huge investment to do one of the smaller scales, but uh, you know, be any project, you know, figure some uh, contingency on that. And then be conservative with the market and the customers. There's only, poultry farming isn't easy. And so, so be realistic on what you can actually deliver and don't overpromise the customer that you're gonna have fresh chickens for 20 restaurants when you can only really just work with one to start. So in that 2014, we actually, with those 600 and what we were already doing, piloted with five. And then this year we have about 25 customers in this market. So uh, that's, that's probably my biggest, if you're going to go into the scale up thing and try to go from direct farmer's market and that, really communicate that with your customer. Uh, they'll, they'll understand if bad weather comes and delivery doesn't get out there, if chickens all die, that maybe for two weeks they might have to pull off the menu. But as long as they know you communicate that with them. Uh, the other thing we learned, if you do this, and there's entities out there that say they're doing this, compete against you on the pricing, they are raising their chickens in Arkansas or Iowa and locally processing them in your market, selling them as local, and the quality is not there, and those customers will come back, so don't lower your price. <laughs> that would be my other recommendation, is, is compete in your market and understand your customer. Talking about a mobile processing unit, so yep. it's in different places? No, like I said, our, ours is right now fixed. Oh, okay. And, and, and when, we, when we're, if we're gonna, we, you know, if you pull up SARE and, and look at the other projects across the country, some of them are, you know, but, but then they don't, like us, we have that state line thing that brings the USDA in. A lot of those other ones in Vermont and those are, are state and they're run by a university or that. And they do go farm to farm to farm. So. And when they do that, I assume that the inspector has to go to each location? The state, state ones, depending on the state, if it's approved and they don't, the state inspect, sometimes the state inspection, there is no inspector. It's just approved, and then it can do it. But Kansas and you know we're we're we got an inspection system that we're USDA, so it doesn't matter. But if if we were to do a mobile one in Kansas, we'd have to operate under those guidelines, and, and uh, probably not have to have the inspector there each time to look at the birds. So it could say if you you weren't going the USDA route, but then in Kansas you have to um, limit, if you're gonna, you gotta choose either USDA or Kansas. You can't as a farm market both ways. And if you would choose the Kansas side, your farm is limited to 20,000. We have a Kansas license or do you? for 20,000 a year, or a year. The inspector shows up every July and that's it. Yeah, that, that's kind of how I understand it from our regional guy that they would, like, like they do with your meat license, they show up randomly once or twice a year. So, okay, thank you. I'm, I'm wondering uh, if you did the, the figures on how the cost of making this mobile facility would compare to the cost of, of doing a traditional stationary uh, facility. A traditional, um, we, we now, I, we have now a all meat type facility, I know the, Last one we, we toured in Colorado that uh, had just the poultry side and the, the, the cream of the crop 
was 1.3 million. If you were just to put up a shed, go through the process with the drainage and that, you would probably be very close to this same figure. Um, but that, you know, that would be, I mean, any expansion, uh, if you did something on the farm, uh, you could probably anticipate around that same cost. I was doing your numbers on the chickens for 600 chickens, figures out to about 1333 a chicken. Yep, yep, that year, that's probably what we are. We're selling them for 1225, those three and a half pounders. And then when you raised your production up to, what was it, 8,000, and just rough figures come out to about 1250 a chicken or something. I was yep. just that's guessing the, the number numbers. I just gave you. Yep. So, how, how much is your your uh, transportation cost on that 15 percent for uh accounting marketing packaging and the transportation you add that's 15 percent. yeah it's about seven percent for the transportation seven to eight two to three for your internal uh stuff and then the other percent goes back into the co-op for infrastructures uh, it's 350 per pound, and the farm is taking back uh, about three bucks. It's like 60 yeah. minus 60 cents, 290, something like that. Per uh, pound or per total bird? Per, per pound. Per pound. 